So what is it? Thou shalt not kill? Or kill them all? Hello everyone, it's your faithful teacher of righteousness, Adam the Second here, with another very important lesson today about that naughty Old Testament killing in the name of the Lord. Which it wasn't, of course. Joshua and the Israelites were heroes who were purging the unclean adulterers, murderers and child torturers of ancient Canaan. This is what the ancient Canaanites of what is now modern day Israel did to small children. Okay? Thou shalt not kill or kill them all? As some kid attending my Bible college once argumentatively asked and was most likely repeating from some other ignoramus. Wrong question. Rather, if you do kill and torture and commit the worst sins which God has commanded you not to as well as other unthinkable ones like this, prepare to be punished in kind, most expediently and with total efficiency, which is more than you deserve. And anyone who is going to persistently ignore the defining reason for this, which is clear and repeated, then please at least stop asking these obnoxious, smart aleck questions without checking the scripture or historical facts. The just reason for God's wrath enacted by Joshua's army is clearly expressed by God and many of the Old Testament prophets well in advance, all the way back to the days of Abraham and Lot. Remember how Abraham couldn't find ten righteous men in the whole city of Sodom? Remember what the Sodomites tried to do to the angels God sent to the city? And this was just the beginning. What of their other most unholy acts? Well, let's go through them now. You've already seen one of the worst in the thumbnail for this video. Yes, the Canaanites were sacrificing children, including newborn babies, to Baal, Molech, and other false gods. So as you can see, when God tested Abraham's devotion, but then mercifully intervened and prevented him from sacrificing his son. This is because Abraham was living amongst pagans who were sacrificing theirs to false gods. Genesis 22 doesn't sound so bad in comparison now, does it? No, what God did with Abraham, when in context with what the Canaanites were doing, was very merciful, and also a test to see if Abraham was as devoted to the Lord as the other pagans were to their false gods. These lands were festering with so much sin that even the Israelites whom God released from Egyptian serfdom turned to false god worship of the golden calf and were not worthy of their own kingdom for another generation. This is because many of the Israelites, including Abraham, whom I just mentioned, were descendants of the Canaanites, who originally represented their god with the sacred bull, or Phoenician bull calf, hence their golden calf idolatry in Exodus. Bull worship was quite common throughout the ancient world, as it often symbolised power. For the Canaanites, it represented the storm god Hadad, or Teshub to the Hittites, who were descendants of Noah in modern-day Turkey, Syria, Lebanon and Cyprus. For the Egyptians, the bull represented Apis, son of the goddess Hathor. And for the Assyrians, it represented Lamassu, a human-headed winged bull. And to this day, the sacred bull is still worshipped in India. Idolatry and false god worship was prevalent in ancient Canaan and the people of Sodom, where we get the word sodomy today, were annihilated not primarily for their sin of sodomy but rather what it represented. It was deliberate defiance and pride as I mentioned in previous videos. God can forgive homosexuals provided they aren't proud of this sin, as is the issue today and with the Sodomites, who also consciously chose to be the worst people imaginable. 
Here's what Ezekiel had to say about Sodom. Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom, pride, fullness of bread, and abundance of idleness was in her and in her daughters. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. Ezekiel 16:49. One of the worst things the Sodomites did was torture those who helped the poor, including one girl who was placed atop the city's walls covered in honey and slowly eaten by bees. Legend has it that this girl's cry is the one that came up to God and brought about the angelic visit. Newcomers were sexually assaulted, as they tried to do to the angels, and were tricked into starving by offering them coins which no one in the city would accept. Another alleged sin of the Sodomites was offering a bed for guests, one that would fit precisely. If the guest was too short, they were stretched to fit, and if they were too tall, their legs were cut to size. They were a very sick and twisted people, and the ancient cities of Jericho and Ai, another city conquered by Joshua and the Israelites, were also in Canaan, very close to Sodom and Gomorrah. God himself intervened against Sodom by wiping it out with an airburst, as I mentioned in a previous video, because Abraham couldn't find any righteous people there despite all his attempts and the chances God gave them, which were extremely generous. Therefore, no collateral damage was done, and they all had what was coming to them. I mean, who outlaws charity and horrifically tortures whoever provides it? That's messed up. The ancient Canaanites were torturing and killing children throughout the lands of Canaan, which now makes up Israel and parts of Jordan. God wasn't accommodating for the Israelites by getting them to attack random civilians in these cities, as the ignoramuses who cried genocide argue. These evil pagans were righteously killed, and it's important to remember that. Joshua was a hero fighting crime. Additionally, it has been archaeologically proven that the Israelites obediently left the spoils of these unclean evildoers as was commanded them by God, namely the grain, which was a very valuable commodity back then. The Israelites were civilized and were a godsend. The Canaanites weren't and their demise was one of the best things that had happened since the grandsons of Noah. You question the Old Testament battles and call it genocide, but you don't relate it to the period. It was a cleansing, a good fight, as is also mentioned, but has been heretically ignored by those who in doing so are instead promoting torture. No ifs and buts, if you're going to intentionally inaccurately reference these Old Testament battles, then that's the side you have chosen. You would rather the Canaanites continue to do this, and if that's the case, then you're just as sick as they are and need help. Get it right before you start your fight. If you're complaining that it's genocide, then you're number one, accepting the biblical narrative which is how we know these battles took place. Number two, if you're accepting the biblical narrative by questioning the morality of these battles in the Bible, the most moral and righteous book of all time, then you cannot ignore the rest, because you've already accepted that the battles took place in the way that they've been testified. So you can't ignore the rest of the testimony to suit yourself, okay? You've just falsified what you're trying to use as evidence against, you morons. This one's right up there with the atheists who keep complaining about a God they don't believe in. If you don't believe in God, then why do you keep complaining about him? If you don't believe in the testimonies, 
then why have you just tried to misrepresent them? Don't expect to use the good book in your defence if you don't believe in it or will invalidate your own defence by nitpicking and not only putting it out of context but deliberately omitting which is deceptive and the work of Satan. There is an agenda there and you would be laughed at in a court of law. You wouldn't even be allowed to present your argument before the judge. It would be dismissed before you even said anything because you are misrepresenting your source. Furthermore, you would most likely be disbarred as a lawyer. That's how serious it is. It's fraudulent, it's done with intent, it's been falsified. IPC section 193, punishment for presenting false evidence. So, I'll say it once again to all those obnoxious ignoramuses and deceivers who are still repeating this thou shalt not kill or kill them all rhetorical fallacy get it right before you start your fight and if you already know the reasons why as i'm sure many of you do then it is you who aren't fighting the good fight and perhaps you should stop disdaining those who did oh man